There are many stories of St. David's miracles. This story, may be fictional or not, took place in the village of Londui Brefi. One day, David was preaching to an audience. People from nearby villages and towns arrived to hear him speak. There was a huge crowd. As David spoke, some people standing at the back had difficulty hearing him. They couldn't even see him. Suddenly, a white dove landed on David's shoulder, and as it did, there was sound of trembling as if there was an earthquake. The earth beneath his feet rose up to create a hill. When David started speaking again, his words could be heard and he could be seen by everyone. David is the patron saint of Wales and perhaps the most famous of British saints. Actually, not too much is known about St. David, except from a biography written around 1090 by Rigi Farsh, son of the Bishop of St. David's. David is said to have been born around the year 520. His birth is said to have taken place on the cliffs in a wild thunderstorm near the city that's now named after him. He was the son of Sande, prince of Poes, and Non, daughter of a chieftain of Menevia. In medieval times, it was believed that Saint David was the nephew of King Arthur. Legend has it that the patron saint of Ireland, Saint Patrick, also said to have been born near the present-day city of Saint David's. He foresaw the birth of David in approximately 520 AD. The young David grew up to be a priest, being educated at the monastery of Hen Finu under the tutelage of Saint Paulinus. Saint Paulinus was a blind man. According to legend, David performed several miracles in his life, including restoring Paulinus's sight. David proved to be a prodigy, learning mathematics, music, and scripture. And he also became a passionate evangelist. When David grew up, he became a monk. About the year 550, he founded a monastery close to the place where he was born. Here, he and his fellow monks lived a simple life, drinking only water and eating only bread and herbs. Meat and beer were forbidden. David became known as Dewey Deferwer, or David the Water Drinker. He traveled around Wales and England, establishing monasteries and churches along the way. He helped setting up the famous abbey at Glastonbury, where it is said that King Arthur is buried. You can still see the beautiful ruins of the abbey to this day. He performed various remarkable feats along his journey that there his name spread like fire across the land. Rigi Farsh tells us that David encountered resistance from a druid and chieftain called Boaya, who, threatened by David's power and renown, he gathered together troops to kill David and his followers. The men who assembled were miraculously struck down by a sudden fever, and they were forced to return home. 
and when they returned to their home, they found that all their cattle had mysteriously died. Now convinced of David's holy credentials, they begged forgiveness, and David restored the animals to life. The stories and legends all point to St. David as an example to follow, a model of a Christian life. David's monastic routine and that of his monks was one of great simplicity and self-denial. Their days were centered on prayer, work in the fields, pulling the plow themselves, and reading. They ate one meal a day of bread and herbs or vegetables. David became known as Aquaticus, or Dewey Deferer, which means the water drinker in Welsh. This was in stark contrast to the more common beer which people drank. Sometimes, a self-imposed penance, he would stand up to his neck in a lake of cold water reciting scripture. This was a contrast to the chieftains and some in the wider church who expressed their power and status in feasting, having many servants and gift giving. Although David had great status within the church, as a bishop and archbishop, he worked alongside his monks doing the little things. His faith inspired him and the stories of his life inspire others. David saw himself as a signpost to God. Many stories also tell of David's kindness and his humility. He was a great healer and scholar, probably speaking several languages, including an early form of Welsh, Latin, and Old Irish. Despite his tough ways, St. David became very popular, perhaps because he had the gift of working miracles. For instance, when his neighbor's land was drying up, he stuck his staff into the earth and a spring sprung out of the ground. At that time, there was a great war against the Saxon invaders from Europe. Swords clashed as the men of Wales fought for hours to protect their land from the Saxon invaders. But despite their efforts, the Welsh were slowly losing. In the heat of the battle, it was difficult to tell friend from foe. The fact that both sides wore similar clothing made the fight all the more confusing. David happened to witness the events. He quickly plucked a leek plant from the ground and continued, Here, wear these so you will know that any soldier who does not have a leek is your enemy. Some of the soldiers thought this was a rather odd idea, but the monk was one of God's men. So they went along with it. Soon, every Welsh soldier was wearing a leek on his helmet. They attacked the invaders, and before long, the Welsh had won the battle. And ever since, leeks have been a Welsh symbol. To remember the victory, Welsh soldiers eat raw leeks on the eve of St. David's Day. His most famous miracle happened at a great religious meeting. There was a vast crowd of people in the audience, and not one of the bishops who spoke could make themselves heard, except for David. A dove landed on his shoulder, and as it did, the crowd beneath him rose up into a hill so that he stood high above the crowd. His voice rang out as clear as a trumpet. Saint David is often pictured speaking with a dove on his shoulder. 
St. David lived to be more than 100 years old, and as he was dying, the monastery in which he lay filled with angels. His last words to his monks and subjects were, Be joyful, brothers and sisters. Keep your faith and do the little things. This is a common saying in Wales to this day. St. David is believed to have died on March 1st, 589. After his death, his influence spread far and wide, first through Britain and then by Sea Cornwall and Brittany. In 1120, Pope Calactus II canonized David as a saint. O oh God! who graciously bestowed on your bishop St. David of Wales the virtue of wisdom and the gift of eloquence, and made him an example of prayer and pastoral zeal. Grant that through his intercession, your church may ever prosper and render you joyful praise. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. St. Bridget of Sweden is one of those women who, despite having lived several centuries ago, still has much to teach the church and the world. Much is known about the life of St. Bridget of Sweden. The spiritual fathers were so struck by her holy life that they immediately began working on her biography shortly after her death in 1373. Bridget, or Birgitta Burgess' daughter, was born into a wealthy, landowning family in the earliest years of the 14th century. She was the daughter of a wealthy governor who used his riches generously. He donated money for good causes and helped the poor. He worked for the just and fair treatment of all the people. Bridget learned these lessons very early in her life. From the time she was just a child, she was greatly devoted to the passion of Jesus. When she was only 10, it is recorded that she had a vision of Jesus on the cross. She heard him say, Look at me, my daughter. Who has treated you like this? cried little Bridget. Jesus answered, Those who despise me and refuse my love for them. From that moment on, Bridget tried to stop people from offending Jesus. When she was 14, Bridget married an 18-year-old man named Ulf. Like Bridget, Ulf had set his heart on serving God. They had eight children, of whom one was St. Catherine of Sweden. Bridget and Ulf also served the Swedish court Bridget as the queen's personal maid. They followed her father's example of caring for people in need. It is said that she even arranged for a hospital to be built on their estate. The hospital was open to all. All her life, Bridget had marvelous visions and received special messages from God. In obedience to them, she visited many rulers and important people in the church. She explained humbly what God expected of them. After her husband died, Bridget put away her rich clothes and lived as a poor nun. She founded a monastery for men and women who lived apart but worshipped together. The religious order was known as the Order of the Most Holy Savior, or the Bridgetines. 
King Magnus Eriksson donated a little palace and land for building a new monastery. But almost as soon as she had begun altering the palace and organizing the work, Christ appeared to her and asked her to go to Rome and wait there until she got the Pope to return from France to Rome. Bridget headed to Rome and remained until the Pope returned from Avignon, France to Rome. Between 1309 and 1376, seven popes lived in Avignon instead of Rome due to the conflict between the papacy and the French crown. When Bridget learned of an epidemic in Rome, she stayed there to assist the sick and dying. While in Rome, she spoke out against the injustices she saw and worked to change situations that kept all people from living a good life. Her words and actions influenced government and church officials, even the Pope. Bridget was unsuccessful in persuading the Pope to return to Rome. Because of her inability to finish many things in her lifetime, she is known as the patroness of failures. One of Bridget's most notable contributions was her writings, The Revelations. In these texts, Bridget recorded her visions of Jesus and Mary. These visions not only included instruction on the creation of her monastic order, but also on questions of theology and morality. They also include vivid visions of the birth and death of Jesus. Bridget made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land to see the places where Jesus taught, died, and rose from the dead. During her pilgrimage, Bridget experienced Christ's presence in prayer visions. Upon her death in 1373, Brigida left the church influenced in several ways. Her daughter Catherine and a granddaughter went on to more fully establish the Burgettine Order of Nuns. The revelations were spread throughout the church and had several key impacts. They became the basis for a lot of poetry, prayer, and hymns devoted to Mary. Her letters eventually helped influence the papacy to return to Rome and influenced church teaching in Sweden. St. Bridget was a successful failure as she was canonized in 1391. Bridget, you were a woman of peace. You brought harmony where there was conflict. You brought light to the darkness. You brought hope to the downcast. May the mantle of your peace cover those who are troubled and anxious. And may peace be firmly rooted in our hearts and in our world. Inspire us to act justly and to reverence all God has made. Bridget, you were a voice for the wounded and the weary. Strengthen what is weak within us. Calm us into a quietness that heals and listens. May we grow each day into greater wholeness in mind body, and spirit. Amen. In 1930, Lucy Filippini's saintly life was adequately acknowledged. Not only was she officially declared a saint of the church, but she was given the last available niche in the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome. The mission, initiated by the Cardinal and Lucy 300 years ago, continues today through the schools and the religious family to which they gave life. Its mission has spread beyond Italy into Europe, the United States of America, Brazil, Ethiopia, and India. Lucy Filippini was born on January 13, 
1672 in Cornetto, Tarquinia. She had not reached her first birthday when her mother died and was buried in the church of San Marco. Her father, whom she loved dearly, also died six years later and was buried in the church of San Margarita in Cornetto. Now orphaned, Lucy went to live with her aunt and uncle. As a child, Lucy would prepare small altars and pray devoutly. It was soon clear that she possessed a precocious intelligence, an inclination toward the spiritual life, and a modesty that was truly angelic. At times, Lucy would seek for a serene atmosphere in the nearby Benedictine nuns' monastery of Santa Lucia, where the daughters of the nobility were educated. Lucy visited frequently, drawn there by her desire to be among those whose lives and goodness she admired. It was here that she received her first communion. It was here that she received spiritual nourishment. One day, Lucy met Cardinal Mark Anthony Barbarigo, who was on a visit to the monastery. He made a lasting impression on Lucy. She followed him to Monte Fiasconi, and under the guidance of the Cardinal, she left behind all worldly things. Lucy had a special devotion to Our Lady, her spiritual mother, and throughout her life, her deep love for Mary and her faith sustained her. Cardinal Barbarigo had special plans to be implemented in his diocese. He envisioned Lucy as a key factor to bring about a rebirth of Christian living. He had already begun by establishing a seminary where young priests might study and train for the ministry of the Word. The next step was to develop a Christian conscience and encourage the practice of virtue in the home. This he resolved to do by opening schools for young ladies, particularly the children of the poor, in whom he saw hope for the future. Lucy would head the schools they founded to promote the dignity of womanhood and help influence a healthy family life. Together, they looked ahead to fulfilling their generous, ardent, and profound mission of faith and charity. By the time Filippini was 20 years old, she had founded the Pious Matrons and was already recruiting and training teachers who would tutor the girls in the domestic arts. The young ladies of Montefuscione were taught domestic arts, weaving, embroidering, reading, and Christian doctrine. Twelve years later, the Cardinal devised a set of rules to guide Lucy and her followers in the religious life. Fifty-two schools were established during Lucy's lifetime. As the community grew, it attracted the attention of Pope Clement XI, who, in 1707, called Lucy to Rome to start schools which he placed under his special protection. To complement the work of the schools, Lucy and her teachers conducted classes and conferences for women who were strengthened in their faith as they took part in prayer, meditation, and good works. Her focus for the social apostolate was to encourage her teachers to minister to the needs of the poor and the sick. Her method of teaching attracted widespread attention. Lucy died at 60 years of age, March 25, 1732, on the Feast of the Annunciation. In 1930, Lucy Filippini was declared a saint of the church 
and was given the last available niche in the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome. This mission, initiated by the Cardinal and Lucy 300 years ago, continues today through the schools and the religious family to which they gave life. Its mission has spread beyond Italy into Europe, the United States of America, Brazil, Ethiopia, and India. O oh God, giver of every gift, you kept St. Lucy Filippini faithful in proclaiming Christ and witnessing to him, the one teacher and light of the world. Grant that illumined by divine grace, we may persevere in listening to your word and preach it by good works, and so be living signs of holiness and apostolic zeal. St. Adelaide was one of the most powerful women of the 10th century in Europe. She was a marvel of grace and beauty. She was born a princess in 1931 and was to become not only the Queen of Italy, but the Empress of Italy. More importantly, Adelaide lived a holy life which wasn't an easy task given her circumstances in life, and was later canonized a saint. The daughter of Rudolf II of Burgundy and Bertha of Swabia, Adelaide was well-educated and very religious. At the age of 15, she was married to the son of her father's rival, Lothari II, the nominal king of Italy. This was part of a peace settlement between Rudolf and Hugh over who would rule Italy. She was widowed in 950 while still a teenager. Lothari was thought to be poisoned by his successor to the throne, Baron Jarius, as part of his attempt to solidify his grip on power, Baron Jarius ordered Adelaide to marry his son. Adelaide refused and managed to flee the castle. She was quickly captured by Baron Jarius' guards and put in prison. After about four months in prison, Adelaide managed to escape. She headed to Canossa, a town in northern Italy. Upon arriving in Canossa, she turned to Otto of Germany for help. Otto only too happy to help Adelaide, marshaled his army and promptly conquered Italy. Having been sought after by various kings and nobles after Lothari's death, she was finally married by Otto the Great of Germany. In the year 952, Otto was crowned emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in Rome. Adelaide was crowned as the Holy Roman Empress. Otto and Adelaide reigned for 20 years. Otto passed on in 973, and Adelaide returned to Burgundy to live with her brother. Once back in Burgundy, Adelaide began establishing monasteries and churches and began to promote evangelization. She used her position to help the poor, for whom she had a special affinity. When Otto died, their son, Otto II, became emperor. However, his wife, Theophano, turned the son against the stepmother, and she was treated very badly. But after some time, a reconciliation was effected by St. Majolus of Cluny. Otto came and on his knees 
begged her forgiveness. In order to thank St. Martin for hearing her prayers and interceding with her son, she sent an ornate imperial mantle that Otto II wore to St. Martin's gravesite. When you will reach the tomb of the glorious St. Martin, say these words, Bishop of God, receive these humble gifts from Adelaide, servant of the servants of God, sinner by nature, and empress by the grace of God. Receive this mantle of Otto, her eldest son, you who had the glory to cover our Lord with your mantle in the person of a poor man. Pray for him. The simple humility of Saint Adelaide can be seen in the words she wrote. Receive these gifts from Adelaide sinner by nature, empress by the grace of God. At the time, as empress of the Holy Roman Empire, she was the most important woman in the world. But she never lost sight that it was God's doing that put her there. Her attention to the public concerns never made her neglect the exercises of mortification and devotion. Her own household appeared as regular as the most edifying monastery. In the last year of her life, she took a journey into the kingdom of Burgundy to reconcile the subjects of that realm to King Ralph, her nephew, and died at the convent of Setz, which she had founded in the year 999. St. Adelaide, no matter the circumstances, devoted herself to Christ and his church. She is the patroness of a number of causes, including brides, widows, princesses, second marriages, step-parents, and large families. St. Agnes of Montepulciano had a reputation for prophecies. She became well known for the supernatural signs that accompanied her growth in holiness. This little lamb was born into a noble family in Graziano, a small village near Montepulciano in Tuscany, Italy in 1268. In the life of Agnes of Montepulciano, God's call was not long in being heard. It is recalled that burning candles appeared to illuminate her crib on the day she was born. By four years of age, Agnes had learned to pray the Our Father and Hail Mary. While other children of her age preferred to play in the fields, Agnes took time to speak with God in a secluded corner. At the age of nine, St. Agnes told her parents that she desired to enter the newly opened Dominican monastery at nearby Montepulciano. Both parents opposed Agnes's wish, but they did allow her to visit the place frequently. On one such visit, a prophetic event occurred. While they were walking, they passed a hill on which stood a building with a bad reputation. As they walked, a flock of crows swooped down, and they started attacking Agnes. The women fought them off as they scratched and pecked at the child. Those who witnessed the event believed the crows were demonically influenced to attack the young and pure Agnes. Years later, a convent was built on that very spot by Agnes when she returned to Montepulciano. The unusual episode 
deeply worried her parents. When Agnes explained about her faith and God's plan, they heeded to the heavenly signs. They entrusted their daughter to religious life, allowing her to enter the monastery of the Sisters of the Sack. She lived an austere life, sleeping on the ground with a stone for a pillow and fasted on bread and water. The sisters she lived with soon recognized that Agnes appeared more like an angelic spirit than a human being. On one occasion, the bishop visited them and enchanted with Agnes. He gave this advice to the religious. Mothers, take care in instructing this child, for her name will be as glorious for her homeland as the saint of the same name is for Rome. She inspired a number of other young women to join that new convent, and she was chosen to lead the community as abbess. She was only 15 and had to receive special permission from the Pope to take on that role at such a young age. It is said that on the day she professed her vows and received the veil, a shower of white crosses like flowers fluttered down on all those in the chapel and nearby, showing heaven's favor. For 20 years, Agnes lived in Procena as a Franciscan nun and abbess, penetrating the secrets of God in prayer. She became well known for her holiness, and special signs accompanied her prayer. She received several visions, once holding the infant Jesus in her arms, and receiving communion from an angel in another. The nuns in her community saw her lifted two feet off the ground when she was praying. When they ran out of bread, she would take a handful of bread from the kitchen and miraculously feed not only the nuns, but the whole community. Most interesting of all, though, was the appearance of manna about her body when she prayed. She would sometimes be consumed in rapturous prayer and a white, frosty-looking manna would appear on her cloak and in the place where she was kneeling. Her sisters reported that in these instances, she looked like she had been outside in a heavy snowstorm. Agnes served in Proceno for 20 years, yet desired to return to Montepulciano. Around this time, she had a vision of St. Dominic asking her to turn herself and the convent to the Dominican order. Agnes departed with some religious to erect a monastery there under the rule of St. Dominic. When the necessary donations were obtained, she acquired the entire hilltop where she was attacked by the crows she built a church dedicated to Our Lady in addition to the convent. The convent became a hub of prayer and penance, with many women joining because of Agnes's sanctity. There are many miracles recorded at this time involving St. Agnes. She frequently multiplied loaves, as Jesus did in the Gospels, to feed those in need. She had also apparently reached such a level of sanctity that those afflicted with different types of mental illness would be restored to health just by being brought into her presence. She miraculously rescued a child who had drowned. The community thrived under her guidance until she fell gravely ill at the age of 49. When it was clear that she would die, her community became distressed, and she told them, If you loved me, you would be glad 
because I am about to enter the glory of my spouse. Do not grieve over my departure. I shall not lose sight of you. You will find that I have not abandoned you. She died on April 20th, 1317, which is now her feast day. Her tomb became a pilgrimage site, and Agnes's body remained incorrupt there. The great St. Catherine of Siena visited her tomb, and it is said that when she bent down to kiss the foot of Agnes's body, it lifted itself to meet her lips. O oh God, you were pleased often to shed a heavenly dew over the blessed Agnes, your virgin, and to adorn with various fresh-blown flowers the places where she prayed. Mercifully grant, through her intercession, that we be sprinkled with the unfailing word of your blessing, and be made fit to receive the fruits of immortality. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Lawrence is the name of the archdeacon of the Church of Rome who was martyred in Rome in the year 258 during the persecution of Christians ordered by the emperor Valerian. He was born of Christian parents in Huesca, a town in the region of Aragon, the northeast region of Spain. The young Lawrence went to Caesar Augusta, today Zaragoza, Spain to study with a renowned Greek Christian teacher named Zistus, also called as Sixtus. When Sixtus left Spain for Rome, Lawrence followed him. A few years later, Sixtus was elected Pope in 257. Sixtus not only ordained Lawrence a deacon, but also appointed him first among seven deacons of Rome. Thus, Lawrence received the title of archdeacon. During those days, the Christian church was still new. It was extremely dangerous to be a Christian. Hostility against the early followers of Jesus Christ was growing. The law stated that if you practiced Christianity, expect to be arrested and killed. As a deacon of the church, Lawrence daily risked his life helping the poor, hungry, and helpless in Rome. While taking care of the poor one day, Lawrence overheard a soldier speaking to the bishop. You are under arrest, said the soldier. Lawrence saw that the bishop didn't object and silently followed the soldier. Lawrence was disappointed that the bishop didn't take him along, even though it was sure that he was going to be persecuted. He ran to his bishop and pleaded with him, Where are you going without your son, father? Where are you hurrying off to, holy priest, without your deacon? What is there about me that has displeased you now, father? Then Sixtus said, I am not leaving or abandoning you, my son, but there are greater contests yet reserved for you. I am an old man, and so I am given an easier fight to finish. But you are young, and for you there is a more glorious triumph over the tyrant awaiting. You will come along soon. Stop your crying. After three days you will be following me. The bishop said these words and left him. As strange as it may seem to us, Lawrence celebrated this fact. 
Soon I will be in heaven. Immediately, Lawrence sold everything he possessed and gave the money to the poor. While Lawrence was dispersing these items, a blind man named Crescentius asked for healing help. The holy deacon made the sign of the cross over him. It was a miracle. The man could see now. Unknown to Lawrence, an officer noticed him giving money to the poor. I bet these Christians have tons of treasure hidden away. I want it for Rome, thought the greedy man. The next day, when the deacon was alone, he cornered him and gave him an offer. Bring me all of the treasures you Christians have hidden and a list of all the wealthy Christians here in Rome. Otherwise, we will arrest and kill you. The deacon thought for a while and asked him three days to surrender the treasures of the church. The officer was delighted. His pride and greed blinded him from seeing the truth. For three days, Deacon Lawrence went throughout the city and invited all the beloved poor, handicapped, and misfortunate to come together. He led them all to the greedy man. Here are the treasures of the church, said the deacon. The emperor was filled with rage. You are under arrest, Lawrence, for not bringing us the money or information we wanted. Your death will not be pleasant. Beheading was not enough for this Christian deacon. We are going to roast you over a grill he ordered Deacon Lawrence to be burned alive in public on a griddle. The officer believed that the pain of being roasted would make Lawrence tell where the money was hidden, give them a list of the wealthy Christians, and deny God. But he was mistaken. The deacon cheerfully offered himself to the Lord Jesus. Lawrence's love of God was so great that he was not even bothered by the flames. In fact, there is a story about his death, stating that while being roasted, he said, Turn me over. I'm not done on that side. Then, just before his death, Lawrence shouted, It's cooked enough now. Then, turning to God in prayer, I thank you, O Lord, that I am permitted to enter your portals. The tradition records massive conversions to the Christian faith as a result of the holy life and death of one deacon who understood the true heart of his vocation. It is still said to this day that all of Rome became Christian as a result of the faithful life and the death of this one humble deacon. They saw in Lawrence a great example of how to live and how to die faithful to the gospel. Oh, glorious St. Lawrence, martyr and deacon, who, being subjected to the most bitter torments, did not lose your faith nor your constancy in confessing Jesus Christ, Obtain in like manner for us such an active and solid faith that we shall never be ashamed to be true followers of Jesus Christ and fervent Christians in word and in deed, even in spite of trials, persecutions, or the sword. Amen. Martyrs are the models of faith. 
especially those who believed and followed Jesus the Christ, and in effect were persecuted, imprisoned, tortured, and killed. Martyrs did not renounce their faith and remained true to their beliefs, even if the consequence meant death. This is what St. Pedro Colonsa demonstrated in his short yet valiant life. Few details of the early life of Pedro Colonsad, spelled Colonsor in Spanish records, are known. Historical records do not mention his exact birthplace or birth date, and merely identified him as Pedro Colonsor El Viseo. While we don't know too much about his early life, what we do know is that young Pedro Colonsad loved the Lord. He was born around 1654 in Visayas, part of the Philippines controlled by the Spanish Empire. He was taught by Spanish Jesuit missionaries there, and the little boy excelled in the study of the catechism. He also likely honed his skills in drawing, painting, singing, acting, and carpentry, as these were necessary in missionary work. He also volunteered the missionaries during their trips to different islands. In 1668, Pedro Colonsad, then around 14, was amongst the young catechists chosen to accompany Jesuit missionaries to the Islas de los Ladrones, which meant the Isle of Thieves. Young Pedro accompanied the priest Diego San Vitores to Guam to catechize the native Chamorros. Life in the Ladrones was hard, and it was hardly accessible because the jungles were too thick to cross. The cliffs were very steep to climb, and the islands were frequently visited by devastating typhoons. Despite the hardships, the missionaries persevered, and the mission was blessed with many conversions. Subsequently, the islands were renamed Marianas by the missionaries in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of the then Queen Regent of Spain, Maria Ana, who was the benefactress of that mission. The missionaries were sustained in their mission by their daily celebration of the Eucharist, frequent confession, and great devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Very soon, a Chinese immigrant named Choco decided to make life difficult for Pedro and his companions. He was envious of the missionaries gaining reputation among the natives. Choco immediately teamed up with Makanjas, who were the local sorcerers. Their business, too, were affected by the arrival of missionaries. There was a viral disease taking lives of children spreading quickly in the island. Choco and his team started spreading rumors that the water used for baptism by the missionaries was poisonous, and this was the reason for the children dying. The natives, grieving the death of their kids, were quick to believe this. An angry mob rose up against the holy missionaries, and their persecution ensued. The worst of it occurred on April 2, 1672, when Pedro and a priest companion arrived at Guam that morning. There, they learned that the wife of the village's chief, Matapang, had given birth to a daughter. Father Diego and other missionaries immediately went to their house and offered to baptize their daughter. Matapang was a Christian and a friend of the missionaries, but he had changed his stand when he heard the rumors that Choco and his gang were spreading. He angrily refused to have his baby christened. To give Matapong some time to cool down, Padre Diego and Pedro gathered the children and some adults of the village at the nearby shore and started chanting with them the truths of the Catholic faith. They invited Matapong to join them. Matapong shouted out his disgust with Christian teachings and was resolved to have the missionaries killed. Determined to kill the missionaries, Matapong went away and tried to enlist another villager, a pagan named Hirao. Hirao liked the missionaries, and he remembered their kindness towards the natives, so he refused to join Matapong. Matapong was angry and branded him a coward. 
He Rao reluctantly agreed, as he couldn't disobey his chief. In the meantime, Padre Diego and Pedro approached their hut and talked to Matapong's wife. His wife, who was a Christian too, was very happy to offer her daughter to be baptized. When Matapong learned of his daughter's baptism, he became even more furious. He ran towards the missionaries and hurled spears at Pedro. With the agility of his youth, Pedro dodged the spears easily. He didn't want to leave the missionaries behind, so he stood there facing the spears and covering the missionaries as best as he could. Many believed if Pedro only had weapons, he could have defeated Matapong. But Padre Diego never allowed the missionaries to carry them. Eventually, a spear pierced Pedro's chest and he collapsed to the ground. Padre Diego could not do anything but give Pedro the final sacrament before he died. After that, Padre Diego was also killed. Matapong and Hirao dragged the bodies of the martyrs to the edge of the shore. They tied large stones to their feet, brought them onto a craft to sea, and threw them into the deep. Those remains of the martyrs were never to be found again. Having proven that Pedro Collingsod was martyred for the love of God, he was beatified by Pope John Paul II on March 5, 2000 in Rome. He was canonized a saint by Pope Benedict XVI on October 21, 2012 in Rome. At a time when people flee so easily from the demands of faith and truth, the martyrdom of 17-year-old Pedro Collingsod stands out in witness to the steadfastness needed to follow the ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. Pedro Collingsod's feast day is April 2nd, the date of his death. He is a saint, especially for the young people and for catechists. Also, he can be looked up to by migrants and evangelists. Saint Pedro Collingsod, you inspire us by your fidelity in times of trial and adversity, by your courage in teaching the faith in the midst of hostility, and by your love in shedding your blood for the sake of the gospel of Jesus. We ask you to intercede for us before the throne of mercy and grace, so that as we may experience the help of heaven and be encouraged and strengthened to proclaim and live the gospel here on earth. All of these we ask through Jesus Christ. Amen. Saint Julia, also known as Saint Julia of Corsica, was a virgin martyr who is venerated as a saint. She, along with Saint Devota, are the patron saints of Corsica. Both of them were martyred in pre-Christian Corsica under Roman rule. Although Julia is included in most summary lives of the saints, the details somewhat vary. A few basic accounts emerge that tell us the story. Bishop Victor Vitensis of Africa wrote most of the story from her time while investigating her cause. Julia was born of noble aristocratic parents in Carthage, South Africa. She grew up with a deep faith and her parents loved her very much. The ancient city of Carthage, founded by the Phoenicians, competed with Rome for domination in the western part of the Mediterranean. Given the high-profile nature of the city, it was also subject to numerous barbarian attacks, and the city's defenses had crumbled. During one such attack by the Vandals, Julia was taken from her family. The Vandals later sold her into slavery. She was purchased by a pagan merchant of Syria named Eusebius. Despite her dire circumstances, 
she did not complain or feel sorry for herself. Rather, Julia accepted everything as a gift from the Lord and performed the most humble tasks with wonderful cheerfulness. In her spare time, she read holy books and prayed fervently. So ardent was her love of God. In fact, her very joyful nature stood out to Eusebius. As such, she quickly became Eusebius's favorite slave. Her virtuous lifestyle and joyful attitude made her the best worker. It was easy to be her master. One day, Eusebius was headed on a journey to Gaul he decided to bring Julia with him. Upon reaching the northern part of an island, he anchored his ship. From a distance, he saw that sacrifices were about to be conducted by the pagans, and he immediately left with all his people to attend the ceremony. On that day, they were slaying a bull to the devils. Julia stayed back in the ship because she would not be defiled by the superstitious ceremonies, which she openly rejected. The governor of the island, Felix, was a narrow-minded pagan who needed to have things his way. Eusebius was welcomed by Felix, and he joined them in their celebration. One of Felix's men saw Julia alone in the ship, praying to God. He quickly informed this to his master, who didn't take this kindly. Felix called Eusebius and asked who this woman was who dared to insult their gods. She is a Christian, Eusebius said. He explained that he had tried to convince her to give up her faith many times. Yet, even being her master, she did not move from her faith. Eventually, he stopped trying. It didn't matter to him because she was a wonderful worker. That excuse was not going to work for the stubborn governor. Eusebius explained he could not bear parting with Julia because she was so diligent and faithful in her work for him. Felix wanted to buy Julia at any cost. He even offered four of his slaves in return for her alone. Eusebius refused, saying, No! for I would lose the most valuable thing I have in the world rather than be deprived of her. Felix was even more angry when he heard this. Then he thought of a plan to get hold of Julia. Felix prepared a banquet and made good Eusebius and his men drink a lot of wine. When they were intoxicated and asleep, he asked his men to get Julia. The men took her to the shore, where she stood before Felix, alone and unprotected. All the governor wanted was to break Julia's faith. He tried to get her to sacrifice to his gods. He told her he would grant her freedom if she would obey. But Julia refused to deny Christ. My freedom is to serve Christ, she said, whom I love every day in all the purity of my soul. The governor became violently angry. He slapped her in the face and ripped off her hair in his anger. Then she was beaten with a whip by his men. Julia remained calm and said that if Christ was flogged and crowned with thorns for her, why should she not endure this punishment for him? Finally, he ordered her to be hanged on a cross until she died. As Julia lay on the cross, she prayed for one last time, and then she died. She died as a result of her faith. Some accounts say that a dove flew from her mouth as she died. Saint Julia underwent a lot of struggles in her short life. She was a slave, she was mocked for her faith. She was even tortured and killed for it. Yet, through it all, her faith remained strong. Saint Julia was declared a patroness of Corsica by the church in 1809. Saint Julia is often depicted with the palm of martyrdom and the crucifix. She is the patron saint of Corsica, Livorno, torture victims, 
and pathologies of the hand and the feet. Her feast day is celebrated on May 23rd.